Hey guys, and welcome to The Breakpoint, a brand new show on Google Developers Live, uh, where we're going to be focusing on dev tools and tooling in general. Uh, my name is Adi Osmani, and joining me is Paul Irish. Um, That's not technically true. Who are you? I'm Paul Lewis. You're uh, not Paul Irish. No, Just yeah, I'm not Paul Irish. I, I made a mask to, okay. to try and cover up for the fact. I don't think it worked out, if I'm honest. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul Lewis, uh, developer programs engineer at Google. Um, the reason I'm standing in for Paul Irish today is he's unwell. So get better soon, Paul. Uh, get so, well soon. Yeah. yeah. So we're here to talk about DevTools and Yeoman. Yeah, we're here to talk about DevTools um, and tooling. Uh, tooling's important. Um, you know, there have been a lot of developers recently that have been starting to take a, a long, hard look at their workflow and the different tools that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. And hopefully in the show, over the next couple of episodes, we're going to give you some tips and tricks on how you can improve your workflow and the tools that you use. So Paul, yep. what do you think about tooling? So well, we were talking about this earlier today. And we were talking about the kind of things that you do uh, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Like when you start a, a, an application for the first time, you, know, you go off and you get um, the dependencies that you need, you know, the libraries. You maybe you even look around and say, "Well, what do I need? Do I need?" You know, you come to this conclusion: I'm going to do, say, an MVC app. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to maybe get Backbone or Ember, or what, one of these yeah, things. Or Angular, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Angular. Yeah. So and then I'm go off and I, I download that, find maybe the repo, go and get that, uh, start coding. Um, there's a bit of fun in the middle of there where I'm, you know, constantly back and forth iterating uh, in my editor and also uh, checking it in the browser, back and forth, da, da, da. and then I. Build it because I want to like compress my my assets yeah. and 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 do all the you know, get all that the script together. That sounds awfully manual. There's it like is. a whole lot of manual grunt work. If there. I'm honest, if I'm grunt work, I like it. If if I'm honest, that is pretty much how I used to build apps. Yeah. Um, and I understand that Yeoman's going to help me out. So. Well, hopefully we will. Um, we found that a lot of developers are pretty much doing exactly what Paul Lewis is doing. It's like um, they're manually going and getting their dependencies. They're manually writing out an awful lot of boilerplate code whenever they want to create a new application. And we think that you know, instead of being one of those developers that take you know like forty-five minutes to get set up whenever you want to create a new project, you should just like take five minutes. If you've got your workflow down properly, it should just take you like five or ten minutes, and then you can have a working prototype going just soon after if you've got your workflow down. So we're going to give you some tips on how to do that today with Yeoman. Um, but before we do that, we're going to take a look at some of the new stuff that's landed in the Chrome Dev Tools um, or the Developer Tools uh, over the past couple of months. So let me switch to my screen. OK, so this is Chrome Stable at the moment. And uh, I guess one of the big things that we've, we added uh, the past couple of months was better support for mobile debugging and sort of debugging your mobile web apps as, as, as easily as possible. So um, I'm currently in settings at the moment. Let me exit that out. Uh, most people who are familiar with the developer tools probably know that you can go into the cog at the very right corner of the screen. And that will open up a bunch of settings. Um, you can then go to the Overrides tab. And in there, you'll see a few options. You'll see User Agent, Device Metrics, and Emulate Touch Events. Now, just to give you a quick visual demo of what this does, if I go and I select User Agent, so I pick a specific browser or perhaps a browser pair with an operating system, I go and I configure some device metrics, I can actually go and preview what this site looks like. So I'm previewing what Google.com looks like um, on an iPhone using iOS 5. And I've set my device metrics to have a set screen resolution of 320 by 480. I can also change the font scale factor if I want to see how fonts may render differently on mobile devices. And I can also emulate touch events. I'm not going to show you how that works just yet. Um, but it's what, what do you think, Paul? That's amazing, useful? actually. So you can quickly you know, choose. I want, I want to, you know, like you say, I want to see what this looks like for an iPhone. I want to see what this looks like. What else do we have in that list? Oh, we've got a ton of stuff. We've no. got like iPads and Android devices, Blackberries, and then the browsers that you're used to on desktop. And we've got other options as well, so if you, in case you want to customize it. Like we've got it. A, we've got a ton of options in there. Um, but this is useful uh, for people that. So, do you use? I was about to show people Chrome Canary and some of the new stuff in there. Do you use Canary for your? Yeah. So. Um, and I, th I think this is what we say regularly anyway. But uh, it's good to have, because you can have Canary alongside Chrome Stable. So it's kind yeah. of good to have Canary open. You can see what's kind of coming down uh, the line and just check that everything's still playing nicely, get access to new features. Exactly. Which is, I'm pretty sure what you're going to do here. Exactly. Um, and have Stable alongside it so you can actually see what all your users are seeing. Yeah. When they're so you're, your app. most of the time, I think people will be using Chrome Stable when they're testing out, like you said, what their users have got. 
But if you want to be using like the latest, hottest features in the Chrome developer tools, there's no reason why you can't be using sort of Canary for your debugging instead. So I'm going to show you some new stuff. Um, before we go and try out some features, uh, if you take a look at Chrome Flags, which and you should do anyway, right? Yeah, because there's tons of there really cool things so in here. There's so much stuff in here. The one I've been playing with recently is the ability to pipe the microphone uh, through to the Web Audio API, which is amazing. Yeah, that frankly. stuff just landed recently, just, too, right? Just the last couple of weeks. So that's it's really a really cool. good way to kind of see, uh, as we said, what's coming down the line. So definitely, definitely yeah. do some of that. So because we're looking at the developer tools at the moment, um, scroll down to the option that says Enable Developer Tools Experiments. Now, this is a new option that will let you take a look at some of the features that we've been working on very recently. They're not all you know, finished and polished off, but you can try them right away and see what's going on and if they're going to be useful to your workflow. So I've gone and I've enabled them. I need to actually go and relaunch my browser now, just so those changes will take effect. That'll load up very quickly. I've got all my tabs back, which is awesome. And now I'm just going to go back to the tab I was on. And let's go through some of the features. So I'm clicking on the cog once again. And now you'll notice that we have a new Experiments tab. right? So let's go to Experiments. I'm going to bump up the font size a little bit so people can see these. Now you'll see a warning at the very top. Basically, these experiments are subject to change. They're not finalized or stable just yet. But you can try them out. So some of the things on this list, have you been using any of yes, this stuff? Yes, I've been using the File System Inspection one. What does uh, that do? So it gives you, alongside all the other uh, resources that you see, so um, any index DB tables, all those kinds of things, you'll see a new one appear at the bottom, which is the file system. So anything you use, uh, anything you store using the Chrome file system um, is available there. So it's really convenient if you just wanted to see what Chrome actually stored under the hood when you use the file system API. That is um, so cool. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff in here. There's snippet support. There's CSS region support. So You've, have you taken a look at CSS regions before? I have. But you have? I have. Are you going to show us? I'm not going to show a demo oh. of this just yet. We, I, I'm gonna, I want to show people snippets and, and some other things. But basically, with, with CSS regions, we have some experimental support of how you can go and you know, inspect named flows on the page and take a look at sort of any other highlighted regions that you want to see in your, in your document at the moment, which is cool. Uh, we've got a bunch of other stuff. So I like this override device geolocation. Because that's really handy. Because if you're, again, if you sort of find yourself, you're building a site with geolocation, you're like, huh, yeah, but how does this work in the middle of, you know, I was going to say the middle of London. I'm in the middle of London. Well done, Paul. The middle of the US. I'm not there. I'm in London. So that would be brilliant for that. This, this, this sounds like the type of feature that would let me change your location. Yes. If I wanted to. This sounds, this sounds exciting. That's mean. That, you were expecting anything worse? No, I wasn't. Okay, right. All right. So uh, override device geolocation, what does that do? So if we go back, Let's enable it, first of all. So um, override device geolocation. Let's, en let's enable a few of these so I can actually show them to you. Right? So Presumably, we need to restart Yes, here, right? we need to reopen the DevTools. Whoop. And now you'll see that there's a bunch of other overrides that have been introduced into the Overrides tab. Now, with override geolocation, if I were to select that, I can then go and type in custom sort of long lat details, um, which I can use when I'm debugging my applications. So I don't have to go and worry about hard coding values or anything like that into my app. I can just do it while I'm debugging and have my app re sort of react to that, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing that we've got is the ability to override device orientation. Uh, so if you wanted to sort of see what would happen if someone you know turned around devices they're using. It's almost like you wouldn't want to take your laptop and go, way exactly. with it. There so, have been people that have been doing that. Really? Yes. I've seen people in, in some offices well, do that. Well, that's awkward. It's crazy. You imagine, you imagine the looks you'd get. And yeah. now, through the power of the Chrome DevTools, You've no got more. them. You've got them. It's awesome. I love it. So um, one other thing that I enabled was uh, something called snippet support. Um, have you used snippets before? I have used snippets. but. What are, what are you going to do here? What am I going to do here? I'm just going to show you what snippets are. Oh, like so it. basically, so we've got a bunch of tabs in, in Chrome Developer Tools. If I go to Sources, and you've enabled snippets in the experiments, you can actually go to a Snippets sub-tab. And you're able to now sort of create new snippets. And snippets are basically just blocks of scripts that you can create, save, or execute, and easily store them inside the DevTools in case you want to use them at any point. So like I can go and I can add in you know, custom functions doing, you know. Or, or something, I don't know. You can have any sort of function you want in here and just have it execute. Um, and it all works. You know, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat.
So how do you actually, how do you then use that snippet in your, so you've, you've created this snippet. Yeah, so you can like, you can like go and run this if you want. This, this code isn't going to run because it doesn't actually have anything in there. But you can then go and run these snippets anytime you want. You can have them interact with the page if you want to do that. Okay. And it's just supposed to be a, a nice little addition to your work. So let's say you, you created some kind of script that was uh, like, that helped you debug. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in the GPU and performance thing. So I'm very much kind of thinking, hey, I could have a little snippet that could do something crazy with a WebGL context yeah. that I only want to do when I'm like debugging. I don't want to include it as a script in my thing. I could create a snippet exactly. and just run that whenever I've exactly. kind of Exactly. And you can just go straight back into the snippets tab and run that code anytime you want, which is really, really fun. Sold. Awesome. So um, one other thing I wanted to talk about. So we've, we've taken a look at some of the experiments in Chrome Canary. We've taken a look at what's in stable. One other thing that we think developers should care about um, are the developer tools extensions that are available at the moment. Um, one that I've written about previously uh, was called Tinker. And I'm going to show you a preview of what Tinker does. It's, it's pretty awesome. So I'm just going to serve up a directory. Uh, this is my to-do MVC project. And I probably want to go and switch off my overrides just so I can see the entire page. So cool. You see how easy that was, right? That's he just really ticked that nice. box or unticked that, uncheck that box. Yeah, and it's so nice. Oh, yeah. Now, Tinker is something that's available um, over at the Tinker website, so tin.cr. And what Tinker does is it allows you to um, make changes within the developer tools to a page and have those changes actually be saved and persist to your original source files. So if I made like style changes or changes to sort of scripts or anything like that, those changes can actually be saved to the source files. So this is what I was talking about earlier. When, yeah. Like when you, you know, you're, you're building an application and then you're like, oh, I'll switch to, to Chrome. Uh, I'll just change that in, in the dev tools because that, that color's slightly off. Yeah. And then you kind of have to remember. And if you make like 10 or 15 changes. It's a big, it's a big deal. Like, You've got to copy those things over yeah. or you have to make sure that you don't like reload your page. It's a, it's a pain. Or if you do reload your page, you're like, no, I've lost all those things. Exactly. Oh. It's exactly. Right, so like with Tinker, what you do is you first choose the type of project that you're working on. I'm currently inside a new Tinker tab that's in the DevTools, um, which you'll have when you install it, right? So I'm selecting the type of project I'm working on. I'm going to browse to the root of where this project is, because Tinker requires that. And by default, it'll automatically refresh to show, sort of show you the changes that you've made, and it'll automatically save. So if I now go back, so let me refresh my page very quickly go back and let's say we may want to make a change like um, let's say I want to change the color of my buttons to something else I for one I'm disappointed you didn't you know, change it to comic sans that you went straight for the color thing there but you know each to their own I uh, I can't fault you for just changing the this color is, this is really the standard of developer we were able to get instead of Paul Irwin. <laughs> it's 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 heart desperate times it's heartbreaking. desperate measures any port in a storm I believe pretty much the, pretty yeah. much okay okay uh, so I've gone and I've changed the color of my buttons to uh, blue. Now, as long as you know nothing has broken, nothing's gone wrong, when I refresh my page, and you can confirm I've just refreshed my yep. page, the changes have persisted. And if I go and I take a look at the source of this document, what you'll find is that in my style sheet, the, um, that change has been saved. So I don't even have to go back to my editor or anything like that. The change is saved, and it's already there. What's even cooler is if you go to like you know sources and you take a look at um, where this stuff is. So let me go to sources and figure out what file I was working in. I can right click on a file and take a look at the local modifications to it. So let's see what local modifications were made. I think it was this file. Where are we? Let's see. So it's because I've refreshed it. Let's, let's make another change so I can actually take a look at local modifications. So let's say we've changed this to green. Right? I go to sources. Let's see if this will work. So now what you'll see in local modifications is all the changes that I've made to this file. And you actually get a really, really nice diff of those changes. Um, if Depending on you know, whether you've gone and you've refreshed the page or not, you can actually see the entire history of what you've been doing to the page and decide about you know, what changes you want to keep and what changes you don't want to keep. Um, yeah, I, was I, just no, I was noticing that because you've, yeah. got, you've got a revert, which I assume reverts yeah. all changes that you've made locally. Yeah. And then there's a presumably a per change uh, apply original content. Yeah, and it'll show you the time that you made the changes and everything. It's it's really, really useful. I like. You like? Excellent. Right, so we've shown you some stuff in the Chrome Developer Tools. Let's let's talk a little bit more about tooling and, and how we can solve some of the right. problems you talked about earlier. Right, early, early we established that basically my workflow sucks. Now, I'll be honest, I have moved on a little bit from that point. But nonetheless... Notice um, he said little. Just, just a little. Okay, tiny amount, tiny amount. Okay. Um, but all the same, I think... 
parts of that workflow still remain for me. And I think, uh, like we said, uh, for a lot of developers, it's very much the kind of uh, the situation. And it's 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 very difficult to to just shift because you know people have got deadlines, they've got these things to yeah, you know, of course, the, the actual coding to do. Um, so I guess we're going to talk about Yeoman, right? Because we're going to talk a little bit about Yeoman. So Yeoman is it. awesome, right? So Yeoman is basically an opinionated workflow for creating compelling modern web applications. Um, for people that haven't sort of tried it out yet or haven't checked out the site, uh, we're available at yeoman.io. And this is sort of a project that a few people, so me, Paul Irish, uh, Cinder Sorhus, and Mikhail Daniel. Paul Irish. Paul Irish um, created a, a few months ago, and we've been working on it. And it sort of built on top of a ton of other great tools like uh, Grunt and Twitter Bootstrap and so on. And I'm just I'm going to show you what it does. It's it's easier to just show you than just keep yeah. Talking. So one of the things that you said though yeah. was that this is an opinionated yeah. tool. Like, right? what do you mean an opinionated tool? Right. So there are like a huge ton of options that people have on the front end these days. Like, you know, do you use SAS, Less, Compass, all these? You know, there's a ton of options. Yeah. And then you have like a whole other side of side of things when it comes to like a JavaScript that you write for apps. Right. Like, are you are you talking about using specific frameworks, or how do you you know structure your whole app, and, and all those things? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that people have to think about. Yes. And we thought, you know, what if we were to try capturing what we think is the best set of options for you to develop a modern app, and into a single workflow? And that's that's basically what Yeoman is. It's a bunch of tools brought together that we we hope works well. So, let me let me sort of take you to a demo of Yeoman and show you how that works. OK, so I've got my screen open at the moment. And I'm going to also have a text editor that I'm going to switch to in just a sec. Right, so with Yeoman, to kickstart off our new project, you just use Yeoman init. So I've typed in Yeoman init, waiting for this to, to go and ask me some questions. So when um, you sort of fire this off, it'll go ask you some questions about what you want to do in your application. Like, do you want to include Twitter Bootstrap? Do you want to include the Twitter Bootstrap plugins? Because, like, let's face it, when you're developing a prototype, you want something that's pretty. You know, it doesn't have to be the prettiest thing in the world. You don't have to go necessarily right. using Bootstrap in production, but it's great for prototypes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, do you want to include the Twitter Bootstrap plugins? If you're a JavaScript app developer, maybe you want to use Require.js and AMD. So, we'll ask you about that so as I well. So, I assume the questions that it's asking are, are based on you know your experience, Paul Irish's yeah. experience, the team's experience yeah. on the kind of tools that people. Need and want in their in their workflow, right? Yes, okay. absolutely. Cool. So, what's while you're talking, basically what it's gone and it's done is it's gone and fetched the latest version of all of these dependencies, and it's put them into a local directory that you can use for your app. Um, we've also gone and sort of scaffolded out some very basic unit tests. Unit testing is important. Do you unit test your code? Yes. Yes. Not always. Not if always I'm honest, not. not always. But if you know, if it's built in, well, that makes it easier. Okay. Good. Right, so we do that stuff for you. And you can then go and like preview what this has created using a server command. So I'm guessing like in previous years when you're like a web app developer and working with a bunch of other code, maybe you use like MAMP or WAMP or always, yeah, all always that one of stuff. those. Yeah. Right. So we thought, you know, why don't we just add this to a command and make this, you know, fire off a server? Um, so if you type in Yeoman server, it'll actually go and fire off a server um, using the contents of the application that you're working on just right now. And it'll actually show you a preview. So on screen at the moment, we have a preview of sort of our compiled Twitter bootstrap files. Uh, we were using compass sources. So this is compiled Twitter bootstrap files. You have HTML5 boilerplate. You have required JS and a few other pieces. And you can go and start coding right away, which is fun, right? So one other thing I wanted to show you guys was um, how Yeoman can help you with something called live reload. Have you heard of live reload before? I have. Let's assume I have not. <coughs> that would make life a lot easier for you right now, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, it would. Okay. So, uh, live reload. Before I show this to you, so live reload is is pretty awesome. Um, it's this functionality that allows you to make changes in your application, sort of whether it's your style sheets or your scripts or your markup or anything, and have the browser automatically reload whenever changes are made to your local files. So you don't have to go and refresh it yourself. So you get this constant sort of um, parallel view of what's going on in the browser and what's going on in your source. So let's see if this works right now. So I've just created a brand new application. Um, I'm going to my index and let me see about sort of replacing Watcha with Watcha Paul. And as we can see, it's gone and it's automatically reloaded the page. I didn't have to do anything at all. It's gone and it's compiled sort of the compass files. If I had copy script, it would be automatically compiling that stuff for me. 
if I'd require JS files, I'd be doing the exact same thing. And it's just really nice. It means I don't have to go and put together a whole workflow and build process that does this stuff. Awesome. Which is nice. Um, sort of on top of that, so let's say that, you know, how, how are you saying that you were handling dependencies before? You were manually yeah, going so out like, to the web, yeah, right? So the classic, yeah, the classic situation is, I don't know, there's a new version of a library, or I want to add a, another library in after after this point, right? So yeah. we created the project, but it's like, ah, now I realize I need this other library in there. So, yeah. you know, yeah, go off, find it. Very much like I did with my original dependencies. Yeah. So just go off, get it, in, and, and drag it in, and hope for the best. Generally speaking, yeah, it's it's a pain. It's it's again one of those manual things that you have to do. You've got to go and open up your browser and figure out where the dependencies are, whether you know you're using the most up to date version or not. So we figured, well, why don't we make this a little bit more straightforward? Mm -hmm. um, so let's say there's a dependency you wanted. You mentioned sort of backbone apps earlier yeah, on. Let's, let's, do it. let's 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 see. Let's say that we we started off with a very basic application structure, and we want to get backbone in our, into our app. So maybe the first thing that we do is try to look and see, you know. Is Backbone available via Yeoman? And it's going to go and it's going to search out. And what you can see here on the screen at the moment is that not only is Backbone available, but there are a ton of Backbone extensions and adapters and plugins also available as well. And I can easily install any of these via the command line. So if I were to do, you know, Yeoman install Backbone just to start us off, that'll go and it'll install Backbone for me. What happens if I do this and then? There's a new version of Backbone released like tomorrow, and I, you know, it's it's early on in the project. I feel like yeah. I, I've got room. You know, I can test this this new version. What what do I do then? What, then all work? you have to do is we have similar to install. We have an update command. So if you typed in Yeoman update Backbone, it would go and it would get the latest version of Backbone for you as oh. well. And something you may have noticed, some people may have noticed, is um, if you take a look at the lines in here. You'll notice that it didn't just go and fetch Backbone. It actually went and it fetched underscore as well. So we're using Twitter's Bower project um, as our package management registry. And when we typed in yeoman install Backbone, it went and it tried to fetch the latest version of Backbone, figured out that Backbone has a few other dependencies, and it also went and grabbed those dependencies for us. Which is, you know, it that's means, awesome because, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like you may have, as you say, sort of dependencies on dependencies. Dependencyception. Dependencyception. I love it. You love it. Of course you do. Why wouldn't I? God knows. God knows. Okay, so we've covered sort of you know previewing stuff and what you do when you were you were writing a very basic application. Right. Then you've got your build process. Yeah. Right? So right. So this is this is the point at which uh, let's call him old Paul. Yes. You know, old the, Paul. The unreformed, the unwashed. Um, I would probably write myself. Uh, oh, let's see. Uh, uh, an ant script. I would use a UE. Jar or something like that to go off and hey, oh, I've been around a while um, to you know concatenate and uh, minify my JavaScript, minify my CSS, make it all good, and then I sort of manually change the paths and all that kind of stuff in my yeah. app and be like, yeah, this works with my minified version, and then push it out live. Cool. You got something better for me? Hopefully. Yes. Right. So we thought we, we took a long, hard look at how people were actually building their projects. And like we said, there's a ton of tools people use on the front end these days. You've got like SAS and you know CoffeeScript and RequireJS and, and what have you. And then when you're trying to deploy something to production, you also have to care about optimizing the rest of your project. Like not just the stuff you're used to, like minification and concatenation, but also things like revving your files and optimizing all the images in your project as well. Now, some people, you know, when you're putting together your own build process, you might just go and say, OK, well, I'm going to pick an image optimization library. Cool. It, it'll do its own stuff for me, right? Um, what we did was we actually went and researched all of the most popular image optimization solutions that are available. And we picked the two most efficient ones in terms of sort of making sure that you get as lossless an experience as possible, but the small file sizes as well. And when you run Yeoman Builds, this is when the magic happens. It will actually go and it will build out your entire project. It will compile any sort of abstractions that you're using. As you can see, it's both um, running a number of tasks on your images as well as other stuff. And there we have it. The project is completely done. I've just finished off a sentence and my project is now ready for me to deploy um, to production if I wanted it. Well, I'm blown it's away. It's done. That is amazing. Done without errors. Done that's, without That's unusual done without for errors. me, certainly. Yeah. But let's carry on. Well, this is. Well, we're hoping that this will improve you as a developer. This Whoa. is specifically built for you, Paul. I mean, it's wow, I'm so <laughs> lucky. 
Um, okay, so we've, we've taken a look at the Yeoman workflow and how it works for sort of basic projects. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about generators. So, right. so yeah, so this, so yeah, one of the things um, that uh, came up when we were talking about uh, Yeoman, and I was asking some questions, is like, okay, like you 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 do something like Backbone, but there are there's models, there's controllers, there's all those kinds of things that you do as well, right? So, um, and what if what if I I don't want Backbone? What if I actually want to start a project with with Angular or Backbone or or any of these? Like, yeah. Does Yeoman? Do I have to go through this multi-step process with Yeoman, or can we kind of shortcut this whole thing? Yeah. So so Yeoman with Yeoman, we wanted to do something fun. Um, so we ported over the generator system in Rails over to Node, and we make available a bunch of different um, what we call scaffolds okay. available scaffolds or generators that allow you to scaffold out new projects using an MVC framework. So we've got a bunch of them that we support at the moment. We've got sort of Angular, Backbone, Ember, and a bunch of others. And the idea is that rather than you having to go and write the boilerplate for like a, a new model or a controller or a router, we'll actually do that for you. Um, let me show you a very quick preview. And I guess then we're going to be um, introducing our special guest for today. Oh, yes. Yeah, we've got a special guest. So um, let's say that you know I want to start off a brand new project. We're going to call this Paul L. Oh, yeah, that's just for is, this me. Jinx, is this jinxing it? Oh, it's just, well, it's, yeah. It, it has to. It's going to be erratic at best. Probably. If I'm honest. See? Okay, so let's say I'm doing Yeoman init backbone. I want to create a new backbone application. And what you've seen it go and do just now is scaffold out you know, everything I need for a very, very basic backbone app. I've got my index, I've got jQuery, I've got um, underscore lodash, I've got a bunch of unit tests, and I've also got my first set of application files. So I've got my first router, my first view, template files, model, collection. And if you go into these files, it'll actually contain the boilerplate um, for each of those pieces for you. So you can just focus on writing the logic for your app. Now that's that's cool and all. Um, but I think I think people will like to see what the Angular guys oh, are yeah. working on. This so, has been this has been pretty awesome. So absolutely. So the um, the Angular JS team uh, were you know were were pretty awesome. They they came in early on in the Yoma project and they were like, well, you know, can we actually build a generator that can replace some of the other Angular projects at the moment that are trying to help people with scaffolding? And can Yoma help you know give a much better generation experience for people so they don't have to write as much code? Um, so I'm happy to uh, introduce Brian Ford from the Angular team, who is going to be showing us uh, some of the stuff that he's been working on. Um, on Angular to do the Yeoman. All right, hey guys. Uh, so as Addy said, uh, I'm I'm from the Angular team. Um, I was uh, tasked with uh, kind of doing some exploratory work and seeing uh, how Yeoman could really help us out. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, we we experimented with this thing that we called the Angular Seed, which was kind of like a, a boilerplate for Angular. So it gave you uh, kind of a folder structure and an, and an index uh, .html that's you know pretty inspired by uh, HTML5 boilerplate and some other stuff. Um, and we have a pretty vibrant open source community, and um, you know we had a lot of people fork this project and kind of say like, well, I want I want SAS support, I want I want Bootstrap in there, or I want RequireJS, I want these different things. Um, and so uh, we were really excited about Yeoman because um, it's, it was really a pain to uh, every time we released a new version or there was some API change, all these projects had to change and it was just a big hassle and um, you know there wasn't like one definitive like here's where you should go for kind of the best practices for starting a new Angular app. Uh, so I think Yeoman's a really exciting project for not just Angular but any of these new MVC frameworks um, to look at. Uh, so with that in mind um, some of the some of the generators that I wrote, um, they they not only just generate um, you know models, views, controllers, uh, directives, which is something awesome in Angular. Um, by the way, I, if you guys haven't checked out Angular yet, you definitely should. It's it's a really cool library. Um, it's a really fresh approach, I think, um, and I think that you'll find that it also really helps speed up that building process. Um, so, a quick plug there. Check it out if you haven't. Um, but it does all these things. But it not only does these, but it'll uh, it'll rewrite um, like routing configurations, and um, it, it makes little tweaks to other files in a really non-destructive way. So I'm not just we're not just you know rewriting some file every time. It's going in there and it's rewriting things. So it keeps all of your changes. Uh, but as you add new routes and things, 
um, it'll automatically you know give you that boilerplate code there so you you can just you know keep hacking away on your app um, so I'm gonna switch then over to my screen and give a quick demo of what this actually looks like all right oh there we go we've got look at those gorgeous people on his screen they right? are so pretty I know all right <clears throat> So here we are at our terminal. I'm going to do a, a yeoman knit angular. Uh, so Eddie showed off uh, what happens when you run yeoman init uh, backbone, I think it was. Um, but we have pretty much the same thing going on here, perhaps a few less choices. So would you like to include Twitter Bootstrap? Yes, for sure. Twitter Bootstrap's awesome. Uh, would you like to use Twitter Bootstrap for Compass? Uh, which is uh, an extension of SAS, so it's the SAS version. Yes, that's awesome. I love SAS. So there we go. Bam! It created a ton of files. Um, you'll see there are a lot of a lot of these different style things, um, but then also it gives you some common Angular files, um, sets up your application, sets up a single controller, and it also sets up here. This is one of the coolest things about the Angular uh, generators: is it also uh, sets up a unit test by default for everything that you make. So you're already set up to do unit tests and you just you know you don't have to fiddle around with some boilerplate code. It'll automatically put that in there. Um, and so that's really cool. Uh, unit testing is really, really huge part of developing Angular JS apps. We want web apps to be really robust and testable and we want to have uh, you know these these tools support that sort of workflow. So uh, let's see what this looks like right now. Uh, so my Linux box is goofy. I think it's going to launch up Firefox, but we're going to ignore that and go to Chrome. There we go. There's Firefox. Cheerio. All right. So oh, the irony. Yeah, the irony. Uh, so here you can see, um, you know, you might recognize the Twitter bootstrap uh, here, and it says we have these things installed. So let's go ahead. I'm going to app script controller main. Ooh, that's some big font. All right, uh, let's add another item in there. Uh, let's see. Technically, we also have Bootstrap, so let's add that and we save it, and we get that auto refresh awesomeness. So that's pretty cool. Um, but let's let's see uh, how we can further support um, building an Angular app with Yeoman. So let's say I want I want another route. Um, maybe I'll open up a new tab in my terminal here. So we would do yeoman init angular route. Um, maybe we'll do like hi Paul or something like that. I like this theme. I think, <laughs> I think, I think perhaps he was referring to other Paul. Oh. He says, we can do we can do a high other Paul as well. Is, we're, we're, <laughs> I, I said at the start we're hot swappable. You know, you just pick a Paul, um, it's all good. Full full Paul interpolation. Absolutely. All right. Um, so we go back, over here, and you can actually just go to Hi Paul, and this is the Hi Paul view. Uh, but let's let's actually add let's add something in here so that we can navigate around. Ooh, it's hard to it's hard to scroll through these things when you have this awesome huge text. Okay. Uh, so maybe we add. A nav element here, and we say we say that this goes to um, Hi Paul. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is supporting HTML5 routing by default in Yeoman. Uh, right now, we don't do that, but I think there's actually a pending pull request that adds that so that you don't have to have this ugly little hash map. Um, then we can just do home, I guess. All right, so we got home and we got hi, Paul. So that's pretty cool. We already set up um, some really simple routing, and if we check our app here, here's where it actually set up this routing. So you see, we have both the high Paul and the high other Paul, and it already configured a controller and a view, and it has it already hooked up. And if we wanted to do uh, maybe add like some ID in here, 
right? Um, then it'll it'll this will persist even if I were to add another another route to it. So uh, all of these changes that you make are you know they're not going to get overridden by the generators. That's um, awesome. That and it seems actually like, there's sorry. sorry what was that? Uh, it seems like almost um, the process of building an Angular app has is in many cases been replaced by just a few lines in the command line. Yeah, I mean it's it's very simple. You just write a few things in the command line, and then um, you know you basically just open up your controller, and you're just like right in the meat and potatoes of your app. Uh, so, for instance, if I wanted to make it so I could edit this list right now, it's actually really super simple. So we just want to expose. Uh, this is like Angular jargon here, but we just want to expose onto our scope uh, a method that maybe adds to our list of awesome things. So we'll push um, scope dot new awesome thing. Right, and this this is this is like some awesome Angular. Uh, almost voodoo we have going on here. So if we go over here to our main uh, view, we can just we can just add an input box here and we can say ng model equals new awesome thing and then maybe we want an input um, we'll make this look nice because we're using bootstrap uh, ng click equals add. I love this because right. you've gone straight into, let me say, the kind of all the setup y type stuff, the yeah. really, really dull stuff, if mm. I'm honest, like the uh, wiring this and that. Less wiring and more actual fun stuff. Yeah. Let's I, face I, it. I'm guessing if he kept on going for like another 10 or 20 minutes, he was easily have like a nice prototype of his app. Just I love it. It's awesome. I've got a feeling he's about to add something to this list. Yep, Boom. I, I just added a few. Sweet. I don't know if you guys can see. Awesome. It very well. Yes, yes, we can. So yeah, again, I think um, I think Angular and Yeoman are a great team together. Um, you know, uh, Angular really focuses on minimal boilerplate, but no matter what framework you use, you're still going to have different references across files, different uh, you know controllers and views and things that you need to link together when you're making these new things. Uh, and so Yeoman is really cool for that. And you know, plus you get all of the awesome things that Addy mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the build process is there, the testing is there. Um, you know, just all of these things, the the image minification. So it's it's just really really awesome. Um, I couldn't imagine developing uh, apps any other way since since using Yeoman. Well, that's, uh, so that's, I, that's, I really, that's 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 what you want to hear, yeah, right? Exactly. That's that's, yeah. that's wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, thank you so much, Brian, for showing us through the Angular generators. That's awesome. Yeah, I guess um, what we should do is we should uh, take a look at the questions on the moderator. Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time, so let's let's yeah, get some questions. Let's see what we got. So we, we may not be able to get through uh, all thirteen questions, uh, but thank you for them. We will uh, obviously get through the ones that we can. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's start with uh, the top one. So first, congrats on the successful launch. That's very kind of you. Uh, plans on letting people define their own code structure today. It's rather hard to introduce Yeoman into an existing environment due to the requirements on folder structure, etc. Also, as a bonus here, Windows support soon. <laughs> so people have been requesting, you know, the ability to drop in sort of existing projects into Yeoman and, and just have it work, and we we totally get that. So we're taking a look at better sort of initial configuration, so that you know, if you if you have a project with a different directory structure to what we think you should be using, um, we're going to give you a nice, easy way in the next couple of releases to just sort of say, okay, well, here's where my scripts are, here's where my styles are. And here's how the rest of my app is structured. And hopefully, you'll be able to just use Yeoman right out of the box without too many issues. So on, the, on that, though, yeah. it's presumably worth saying that Yeoman still is opinionated. Yes, yes, uh, of and, course. And that's, you know, that is a, a core part of Yeoman. Uh, so it's probably, what, a compromise somewhere yeah. in there? It's like, yeah. you know, yes, you can tweak things a little bit, but do expect it to still be Yeomanish. Absolutely. Well, and and you know, we, we always tell people if if you find that you know what you're trying to do is a little bit too much outside of you know our own opinions, um, we do recommend you know, do check out Grunts, which is um, a project that Yeoman builds on, uh, because it you know it allows you to customize a lot more. It's more for those people that you know know what you're they're they're doing. They they've got a good idea 
of all the tools they want to support and want something you know a lot more custom. Uh, there's also a question about Windows support. So we don't officially support Windows just yet, but I will say I was I was doing a tooling workshop in Amsterdam last week, and I'd say half the class had Windows boxes, and they're all up and using Yeoman. So it, it does work at the moment. Um, there are one or two little tweaks we still have to make to improve the user experience. But Windows support is coming. It's definitely something that's on our radar. Awesome. OK, so um, can Yeoman be expanded for other languages, such as PHP? Interesting question. So um, quite a few people have also been saying, you know, I've got, I've got an existing back end. Maybe it's written in PHP or Rails or .NET or something else. And we, you know, we, we want to try helping developers with the broader stack as well. There, there are a ton of different variations on that, right. though. And, and we obviously can't help um, everybody with everything. So what we're going to try doing um, sometime in the near future is giving you a solution for how you can use your, sort of integrate your existing back end with a front end um, that's powered by sort of a Yeoman workflow. Uh, it's definitely something we're looking at, and it'll probably just take a little while longer to, to properly think through the design of that. OK, that's actually uh, taps into another question. So you've answered that one mm -hmm. uh, by proxy, which is great. Um, would be awesome, apparently, uh, if WordPress and other CMSs had integration as well. So you it's, know. Inter it's interesting when you say integration. What, what do you think integration means there? Well, that's it's a good question. Um, I'm machine. Well, this the question here from uh, Simon. Uh, he's sort of saying WordPress database HTML5 boilerplate theme build script. Boom. I love so, actually, boom. so actually, uh, a nice fellow called uh, Romain Berger um, came up with a WordPress generator for Yemen. Um, I haven't taken a, a full look at it just yet, but the idea there is that you can actually generate um, WordPress projects using Yemen. Yeah. Um, and I guess I mean that's, that that seems to be what what the question is asking. Yeah. It's like yeah. okay, yeah, because if you if you were to scaffold out today. Um, a front end, mm. it would be, uh, I suppose, yeah, ignorant of uh, any particular CMS yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So it's good to know that there are, in theory, generators. And I guess, I mean, that's the point of the community, right? Is if if, if, if if you want to write these generators, uh, you can look at the existing generators. You can create your own. Uh, there's pull requests, as you say, for a WordPress yes, one. Yes, absolutely. You know, so get involved. Help you know, help out. Yeah, uh, that'd be awesome. That's that's what we're, you know, hoping people will do. Yeah. Let's let's take one more question, and okay. then we're gonna. Can you talk a little? Uh, about Yeoman Insight. What are the plans to share this wonderful data with the world? Thank you, Eric. Oh, of course. Yes. Uh, so Yeoman Insight was this idea to sort of help track some of the different things that developers are doing on the front end. Um, the idea is that we don't really have this this sort of great source of information about you know what what frameworks people are using. You know whether people are building large scale applications or something a little bit smaller. Um, what the pain points of people's workflows are. And so Insight is sort of this opt-in feature of Yeoman. So it's completely you know, optional. You don't have to use it. We do like you too if you, if you can. But um, basically, it'll track some of the stuff that you're doing um, and send it back to us. We aggregate the data. And at some point in the near future, we're going to share a lot of that information. So, so we'll, we'll let you know what frameworks people have been installing and using with their apps, um, what the most popular commands are, you know, whether people are just using Yeoman for you know, tons and tons of smaller projects or just on sort of much larger, beefier things in production. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're hopefully going to plan on, on getting that data out soon. I know that you said this was the last question, but I did see one at the bottom here. Is that Paul Irish on the right? I think uh, no, uh, unless Paul Irish suddenly became British. Uh, there's Paul Irish now on the left. Unless Paul Irish became British and, and lost all his hair. Um, no, I'm Paul Lewis. Uh, but uh, you know, Paul Irish is unwell this week, so hopefully he gets better for Get next well time. Soon. Get well soon. Uh, so on that, thank that's, you. That's, that's it. it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to my special guest, Paul Lewis, for stepping in. Thank you. And we'll see you again on the next Breakpoint. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. See yep. you later.